Evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Just before we start, just uh, a couple of house rules for those that haven't been on one of our sessions before. Uh, first of all, I'm Ashley Lerner. I'm CEO of Maccabi GB. Uh, delighted to see you all here. Uh, for um, this evening, we recommend that you have your uh, Zoom on speaker view. We will be muting you for the Zoom call. Uh, after the interview, we'll be opening the floor up for an audience Q&A. If you do have a question and you'd like to ask it uh, via the chat box, um, we will then collate them and then we will ask them via Rob. Um, or we will turn to you and we can then ask you directly. If you have any problems during the evening, uh, please send a message to someone uh, with Maccabi GB next to their name uh, and we will uh, endeavour to help you. Uh, please note that we will be recording uh, the session tonight uh, so that we can share it with the community afterwards. Um, and I would now like to introduce you to David Pinnock, Chair of Maccabi GB. David. Evening, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our, the latest in our series of online interviews. And I'm especially pleased to welcome guest um, Gary Lewin, who joins us this evening. For most people, the name Gary Lewin is synonymous with both Arsenal and England. He has outlasted most, if not all, the managers of both teams. Quite an achievement. Gary was the physiotherapist for Arsenal, West Ham, and the England national football team, not forgetting his involvement with Maccabi GB at the European Maccabi Games in Budapest in 2019. Gary joined Arsenal Football Club as an apprentice professional footballer at the age of 16 in 1980. After being released from the club in 1982, he qualified as a physio in 1986 and became Arsenal's first team physio for, for some 22 years, ultimately becoming the head of medicine. Alongside his role at Arsenal, Gary was also appointed to the England senior men's football team in 1996 for the national team. In 2008, Gary became full-time head of physiotherapy services to the FA and lead physio to the England senior men's team. Remarkably, between 1996 and 2016, Gary headed up the medical team at five World Cup finals, four European Championship finals, and two under 20 World Cup finals. Gary was also integral to the design for the medical facilities at the Arsenal Training Centre and at the Emirates, as well as the Na FA National Football Centre at St George's uh, Park. In 2019, he set up the Lewin Sports Injury Clinic in Essex. In short, there can be few people who have carried more buckets and sponges, dished out more magic sprays, massage more legs and been as physically close to some extremely talented footballers over the last 30 plus years in what all of us would describe as an amazing and glittering career. And we're really looking forward to hearing some of the inside stories tonight. Once again, I'm also pleased to welcome our host interviewer this evening. Rob Nothman is well known to all of us at Maccabi GB and we're honored to be able to call him a great friend and supporter of ours. Rob has an instantly recognizable voice, and we know that he is always extremely well prepared. And apart from having a large repertoire of fascinating sporting stories himself, as we learned from him recently, Rob is just the best professional sporting interviewer around. Gentlemen, welcome, and over to you both. 
Thank you, David. Mute. There we are. David, thanks so much for those very kind words. Um, it's wonderful to see you all again. Thanks for supporting this event. I'm very much looking forward to this because as David was saying, uh, we have in our midst somebody who is going to entertain, inform and educate, uh, living up to the BBC mantra that I've made a, a career out of over the last 30 years and more. Um, I suppose, Gary, we need to start by the fact that I reckon that on March the 30th, you are going to be extremely busy because on March the 29th, as we've just heard, outdoor sports are going to resume. So I presume on March the 30th, you're going to have a lot of people filing into your clinic with all sorts of strains and pulls. Well, that's the cunning plan. We keep our, not that I want people to get injured, but yes, it will, uh, it definitely will help business. What, what do you think the last year has been like working within football in a COVID world? Because, you know, the role of the physio is tough enough. You've got a lot of things to have to look after, a lot of people to look after, and yet you've had extra um, protocols to follow and to ensure that the whole club follow those protocols. So I know you're in touch with all of the, phys well, a lot of the physios of both for England and for Premier League clubs. So what's that been like? It's been a very strange year. Um, so many things have had to change. Um, the way we work, the way we interact with players, um, the way we write our protocols. <clears throat> Some examples of that. I mean, I, I'm still involved with the Arsenal women's team. So we've been writing all the COVID protocols for the training ground um, in, along with the men's teams. I also now teach for the FA, so I teach advanced first aid. And it's things like re-educating re people how to do CPR um, in COVID protected times. So you have to use face coverings. Um, you can't put any airways in place because of air generated procedures. Um, you can't spend more than 15 minutes treating a player. Um, you have to keep social distancing at all times around the training ground. Meetings in enclosed rooms can't last more than 15 minutes. Uh, meetings in ventilated rooms can't last more than 30 minutes. Um, you're traveling to the games. You used to be on one coach, but now most clubs are on two or even three coaches. Um, the dressing rooms are split into two. And so you have half your team in one dressing room, half your team in another. Um, wearing face masks on the bench, having... Um, PPE, which is the protective gear that you use, and you've got different levels. Levels two is what you're seeing everyone wear on the bench, and that's a face mask, an apron, and gloves. Level three is when they're in the full suits and they've got a respiratory mask on, they've got goggles on. And if you're treating a player on the field of play that has got um, a problem that it's a procedure called an aerosol generated procedure. So if they breathe out on you, or you're going to go on their airways, or in principle, if they've got cuts above their clavicle, you're supposed to be in PPE three. <clears throat> so you'll see a lot of the first aid paramedics running on the pitch now in, in the space suits rather than the physios. Your emergency action plans have to completely change. Um, so it, it's, it's been a complete overhaul in the way that you work and the way that you practice. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on and how things, because it's part of how being a physio, I suppose, has changed and it's changed profoundly in the last year. But let, let's just dip into a, a famous night and get some memories from you, first of all. So 32 years ago, May 1989, there you are at Anfield with Arsenal needing to win by two goals to win the league title and unbelievably Michael Thomas scores with virtually the last kick of the game. So just talk to us a little bit about the build up to that match because you're largely responsible because you got in fit, didn't you? We got in fit for that game. We played Wimbledon 10 days previous to that game um, at Highbury and the gist of that season is we had three games left. We had Derby at home, Wimbledon at home, Liverpool away, and we needed six points to win the league. So we then go and lose to Derby, 2-1 at home. We then draw with Wimbledon at home, equalising in the last minute. 
And in that game, Michael Thomas injured his knee and he had a strain to his middle knee ligament. So for 10 days, we were treating him 24 hours a day. I mean, he was radioactive by the time we finished with him. And uh, okay. in those days, we travelled up on the day of the game. We didn't fly anywhere. You went up on the coach on the day of the game. And uh, the day before, I took him out for a field test. And uh, he got through it okay. And my last words to George Graham were, he's fit to start, but I don't think he'll finish. Because any block tackle on that knee, I'm not sure the knee is strong enough to take it. So it shows what I know. He actually scores a winning goal in the 92nd minute. So there are occasions when, yeah, it all comes together. And it was just, a, it was an incredible night, um, which, yeah, it, it's something you'll never, ever forget. And didn't you have to run on, it's still 1-0 with about a minute left. You had to run on and treat Kevin Richardson, didn't yeah. you? And then he went down with cramp, yeah. Yeah, he went down with cramp in our penalty area. And... Um, Again, the other thing, see, in those days, they never put the amount of injury time up on a board. So nobody had any idea how long the referee was going to play. So I remember going down with Kevin and I think John Lukic come up to him and Lee Dixon come up to him and I was treating him and they were basically kicking him and telling him to get up because we've, we've only got a minute left. So we dragged him up, we got him up. And the irony of it was the injury time that they gave us was probably the time that Nicky managed to score the winning goal. So, yeah, it was... You Sometimes in sport, you get these weird occasions where everything that can go right goes right on the day or on the night. And it was one of those, one of those evenings where everything went so well. And, um, yeah, you, you, there's been books written on it. That's all I'm going to say. It was, it was a great night. It happens, you know, reasonably early on in your career. Has that night ever been eclipsed for just sheer excitement and joy? <clears throat> Look, I've been so very, very lucky in my career over the years. Um, and there have been other occasions. I, re I remember with Arsenal, I remember doing the Cup double at Wembley in 93 when it went to extra time and we scored in injury time of extra time when Andy Linegan headed the winning goal. Um, I remember us doing the double on my birthday in 98 uh, at Wembley when we beat Newcastle. Um, going to England, I remember going to Rome and drawing nil-nil in Italy to qualify for the 98 World Cup. One of the greatest nights of my England um history really was Germany away, beating them 5-1, um, beating um, Argentina in the 2002 World Cup. Um, I, I could go on and on and on. I've just been so lucky. They're all special in their own way. But I've got to be honest and say nothing would ever, I think, eclipse 89, just by the fact that nobody gave us a, a chance in hell of going up there and winning 2-0. And it's fair to say that that Arsenal team contained quite a few characters. So um, just give us a little flavour of what happened afterwards and the celebrations. Well, as I said, we travelled up in the morning of the game. Um, so obviously it's been, it was a bit chaotic in the dressing room when we got on the bus. Um, and as soon as we got on the bus, the lads are planning the night out. Um, and so we got back to London Colney, I think we got back to London County about two o'clock in the morning. It was something silly. And uh, the lads had already arranged to meet up at a pub in Southgate. Um, there's some great footage going around of the lads getting off the bus. So we dropped some people off at the training ground um, and some equipment. We then took the coach to Southgate, to drop the players off to go into this party. Um, I had to go back to the Highbury with the kit man to unload the kit at the ground. And I remember coming down Highbury Hill and there must have been a thousand people having the street party at seven o'clock in the morning. Oh. Um, and it was just it was just a mad atmosphere, absolutely mad atmosphere. I mean, we'd gone but 71, we won it before that. So 18 years before we'd won the league. Um, so it was almost mass hysteria, really, um, doing it the way we did it. So give us an idea, as you said, you would you would run on onto the pitch at Anfield there and try and get Kevin Richardson back so he could take part in the game and create that final goal. How, in a way, your role has changed and the level of expertise and backup and knowledge that has evolved as you've gone on through the decades. When you look back now to the late 80s, can you, in a way, believe how in a way, simple and straightforward things were then, 
and how they've developed now? Well, I'll give you one simple example. Um, when we won the league in 89, George Graham was the manager. Theo Foley was his full-time assistant. Um, I was the full-time physio and Tony Donnelly was the full-time kit man. All other members of staff of the first team were part-time, including the doctors, um, the goalkeeping coach. Didn't have fitness coaches in those days. Didn't have masseurs in those days. Fred Street, was my previous said, had a saying that for, about massages. Good players don't need it. Bad players don't deserve it. Um, and so there was four, four full-time members of staff. So that was it. That was that was the entire staff. Um, I mean, it actually worked in my favour because um, when you win the league or a cup, uh, the FA or, or the league, they give four medals to staff. And because we only had four staff, I managed to uh, be presented with a medal when we won the league that night. So um, if you skip on, when I left in 2008, um, we had three physios for the first team, one masseur, uh, one fitness coach, the doctor was full time, and they had one analyst. Um, currently, at Arsenal, and they're probably the same as the other teams Tottenham, United, Liverpool. They've got four full time physios, three full time masseurs, a full time osteopath, two full time doctors, three full time analysts, three full time fitness coaches, um, a part time psyche. Um, a full-time nutritionist. Oh, no, I think it's just gone part-time. Part-time nutritionist. And that's just on the medical team. If you look at some of the teams in the Premier League now, they have pre-COVID, they would have the team bus and then they'd have the staff bus running behind because there's so many staff. Some teams now travel with up to 20 backroom staff. So that's just the staffing levels. That's without the technology that's changed. In the 80s, when I first started working, we could X-ray a player and that was it. Now you've got ultrasound scans, MRI scans, CT scans, um, ultrasound scans. So, um, yeah, everything has transformed completely in the last 30 odd years. And at Arsenal, how much did that coincide with the arrival of Arsene Wenger in 1996? I do remember him arriving and some of the headlines, Arsene who, and now when we look back that was so derogatory bearing in mind what he brought to English football and how he changed the culture was he very keen on finding out more about your role and how it could develop he brought a lot of things to the table um football started changing already because there was more foreign players I mean we'd already signed Dennis Bergkamp and we had David Platt come from from Italy um and English players were experiencing foreign football. Um, so things were beginning to change. The staffing levels were definitely beginning to change. The demands from the players was beginning to change. But then Arsenal took it to a completely new level. I mean, people will talk about so many different aspects of what Arsenal brought to the club. But the biggest thing that I would say he brought to the club was making the players aware that training was as important as playing. Um, historically, as long as you played and performed on the Saturday, the manager wasn't that bothered what you did all week. And you could have a player that missed it with training, but would still go out on Saturday and play. Arsene was the complete opposite. You trained the way you played. And if you didn't train fully and properly, then you probably wouldn't play on Saturday. And so players become, their lifestyles improved, the way they looked after themselves off the pitch, preparing for training, training, preparing for games. We started going to hotels the night before every game, home and away. Um, and his philosophy was, no, we're going to eat the right food, get the right amount of sleep without any distractions whatsoever. Um, and so he transformed in the, the whole concept of preparation for matches. Obviously, we had a new training ground and um, we had a big say in the design of that and he had a big influence on that. So he brought a lot of, lot of good things to the table. What about the change in diet in particular? Because fr from what one can gather, it took a little while for some of the senior players in mm. particular to buy into that. Now, yeah. um, you may not necessarily have been that person who is, uh, was involved in pre you know, preparing or advising on nutrition. But on the other hand, you are very much trying to get these players as fit as possible. So did you find yourself having to 
reinforce those messages with players who were moaning like hell. Yeah, I mean, we brought a nutritionist in from France who was part time and he would come over every couple of weeks. Um, but it was my job to enforce his protocols and his principles. And one of the biggest things was in the, the general concept of sports science and nutrition at the time was what we call quick sugars. So the belief was that you would have sugary products before a game, during a game, half time, and you'll get a quick rush of sugar, which gave you energy. Well, um, Dr. Rougier, who was a nutritionist, came in, he blew that concept into touch and said, it's about slow sugars. It's about eating food hours before you play that you can absorb and then release while you're playing. Otherwise, you'd have spikes in your performance because you have a quick sugar, you have a rush, and then you have a drop. And in a 90-minute game, you can't afford that. You need to be constantly providing energy to your body. So all the quick sugars went out the dressing room, things like jelly beans, jelly babies, Mars bars, um, Jaffa cakes, all those sort of things that were in the dressing room on the shelf for anyone to take whenever they wanted, that went out the window. Now, at first, you've got professional athletes whose bodies are so used to having quick sugars, suddenly they're deprived of it, they start pulling the wallpaper off the walls, and they start going mad. And there was one time when we were on the bus coming back from a game, and with one, and the lads started singing, we want our Mars bars back. And Arson could not understand what they were talking about. Um, so he, he transformed that. Now, in the real world, what happens is, if you're successful and you start winning, people buy into it. Now that season, when he had his first full season, we went on to do the double that year. But a lot of people forget, again, we played Blackburn at Highbury just before Christmas and we got beat 3-1 and we got booed off the pitch. And everyone was questioning Arson and the team. And we went, I think we dropped to fifth in the league. Um, but he stuck, he stuck his heels in and said, no, this is the way forward. This is the way we're going to go. And then we went on an incredible run to end the season and then ended up doing the double. Professional footballers can be daft at times, but they're not at absolutely stupid and if they see the benefits of what he was bringing and putting on the table they're going to stick to it and if you've spoken to read any of the books of the Lee Dixons, Tony Adams, Steve Bowles, Martin Keown's, Nigel Winterburns they will all tell you the same thing those principles got them an extra five years in their career because um, they carried on playing until the early 2000s and they would not have done that if they would have carried on the pathway they were on so I think that that was a massive thing that he brought to the club. So go on, give us a little bit of gossip here. Who was the biggest moaner, though, at the start, who then became, in a way, one of the great supporters and believed that this was the way forward? Who was moaning to begin? Who did want his Mars bars? All of those above, the older guys, the Tony Adams, the Steve Bowles. Martin wasn't so bad. Um, Nigel Winterburn moaned for England. He would moan. He would moan no matter what we did. Um, yeah, and, and they were funny. And, and don't forget, yeah, we also come from a culture of drinking. And uh, Arson changed that. All, all the alcohol was removed off the bus. One of my biggest jobs under George Graham was getting a, a beer on the bus after a game. And the drink was allowed in the uh, players' lounge, and we used to call the halfway hour. Arson stopped all of that. Because as soon as you finish the game on the Saturday, the first thing he would say after the game, come on, let's get ready for our next game. And the first thing he would be thinking about was rehydration, refueling with the right food, getting good night's sleep in the following day to do a recovery se session so they recover for the next game. And that was the biggest thing that he pushed with players. He very rarely... Um, looked at a game straight afterwards in the dressing room. He wouldn't come in ranting and raving. He wouldn't be talking about the game. He would just come and say, OK, let's clear up. Let's get ready for the next game. And then what he would then do, he'd analyse the game and individually would go round to the players and say, I think we should have done this. You could have done that. What do you think about that? And it was something the players really liked. It wasn't confrontational at any time. It was almost educational, but they were part of the process. 
so much of this is, is fascinating, Gary. I must admit, there's, there's one thing that really does intrigue me. So I imagine the scene there in your physio's room on the couch is player A and you're massaging away, trying to get you know their calf fit and what have you. These sorts of sessions take quite some time. And in the course of it, I would imagine you get to know these players very well, all their problems, all their moans, all their gripes. So is being a physio as well being a good listener? And if so, what did you learn about yourself as a listener during those years? I think probably the thing I'll say, I mean, physios are social workers. You're, you're listening to the problems. You're trying to help them resolve the problems. You know they're giving you information that they, they want fed back. And you also know they're giving information they don't want fed back. Um, what I would say is you have to build up a trust of the players. You have to build up a trust of the management and your decisions on which way you go with the information you gather will determine um, how successful you are, what you want to do. And experience plays a, a big, big part of that. But the biggest thing I, I would say, and the thing I say to any young physios in the game or trying to get into the game, you must always, always remember you have a duty of care. Now, ironically, everyone thinks our duty of care is to the player. Actually, our duty of care is to our profession and protecting our profession. We're chartered physios and we have a code of conduct. You have a duty of care to, to protect your profession. You have a duty of care to protect and look after your player. You have a responsibility to your employers. But you must never forget where your duty of care lies. And... That's a very fine line to tread. Sometimes you do get it wrong. The art is to get more right than you get wrong. But you can easily lose their trust. Well, just picking up on, on that, um, and by the way, we'll have some time for questions later on. Um, if you want to um, ask any questions, you can put it on the chat facility here and where they'll be passed on to me to put to Gary later. Arlette Garcia asks you, what would you recommend for anyone wanting a career in physiotherapy, whether it be sport related or otherwise? I think the biggest thing that I would advise people is you're going into a profession that is a caring profession, but you're also going into a profession that's a very unsociable, hour wise profession. So if you're going to go into sport, sport is played in unsociable hours. So you have to have a great commitment. And if you're going to go into the professional arena in any sport, you really have to show that you're committed to putting the work in. Um, the example that I would give is when I left Arsenal in 2008, I had my first Christmas day off in 25 years. I had my first New Year's day off in 25 years because you're always working. I asked them, I'd probably average one day off a month. You're working seven days a week, 24 seven, you're on call all the time. Slightly changed now because there's a lot more staff than there used to be, but your dedication to the profession um, is, is untold. You, you really have to work at it. So if you're gonna go into the profession, everyone go get, becomes a chartered physio has a certain level of qualification you want to stand out a little bit more so during your years of training or pre-training or even after you're qualified post-grad you want to be doing things that show you're prepared to go the extra mile you're volunteering for marathons not to run them but to work on them um, you're volunteering for half marathons charitable events um, you're work, helping out your local sports club your local football rugby cricket club and so when people look at your cv they see that you're a chartered physio but actually, look at all these things you're doing in, in your own time to show how dedicated you are. So that's probably the biggest thing that I would say. So I wanted to take you again to some particular moments from your career. Um, I think behind you, you were showing me earlier, you have a, a signed shirt from John Terry. And there is a, a particular reason because... Um, not well, I've done, sorry, I've done this wall because this is the England wall. And the other walls are the Arsenal walls. And I know there's a lot of Tottenham fans here, so I don't want to upset them. So yeah. I've stuck behind me just to be 
politically correct. Very good, Gary. I think those Spurs fans are upset enough at the moment. <laughs> um, but that, the John Terry one in particular is for a very good reason, because not to beat around the bush, you saved his life on the pitch, didn't you? I Yeah, I mean, I did first aid on him. He, he was knocked unconscious. Um, I've got to put this to bed. You can't swallow your tongue. The headlines was John Terry swallowed his tongue. What happens is your tongue is a muscle, and when you're unconscious, the muscle can flip to the back of your throat and it can block your airway. And he was unconscious. His tongue was blocking his airway, so I did a simple uh, manoeuvre, a jaw thrust. That made the tongue flip forward. It opened up his airway, and he came round. Um, obviously, if I hadn't have done that, you're right, he, he, he would have had um, problems because, obviously, he had no oxygen going to his brain. Um, so, but that's part of first aid training. That that's what you're trained to do. And uh, yeah, he very so kindly gave me his next England shirt. Right. But he had to sign it. He, he signed it. Um, um, the best physio in England. Um, thanks for looking after me, and thanks for saving my life in the cup final. But we still beat you two one. <laughs> so, how long did you have when you run? First of all, you obviously weren't you weren't the Chelsea physio. You're the Arsenal physio, but you. No, were- I, I'd been on to treat a goalkeeper, and one one thing you do is if you treat your goalkeeper from experience, you stay behind the goal to make sure that he doesn't collapse after he's caught the next ball or kicks the next ball. So Chelsea won a corner. Um, somebody had thrown a coin or something at, at Manuel Amunia. So I'd gone on to treat him and I was kneeling behind the goal. And I saw Abu Dhabi uh, obviously kick John in the bottom of the chin. And I mean, you knew that he was out cold before he hit the deck. So instinctively, you just go on. You don't even think about it um, because you know it's such a, a dangerous situation. So I went on, I, I put him in a draw thrust um, and did a C-spine hold on him. And then the, the Chelsea cavalry followed up behind me and I passed over to them and they walked off and let them take over the control of their player. Under those circumstances, I don't want to dwell on it too long. How long do you actually have in those situations before you... Well, if you, if you take off from the way from the brain, you've probably got about four minutes before any kind of damage is done. And then... Um, I think you, you performed something similar on David Rowcastle, did you? Yeah. Yeah, similar thing happened to David at Millwall in a cup match at the old den. Not the very pleasant new den. This was the old den. Which you, some of your uh, listeners tonight may remember. Um, and yeah, it was um, there that night. Um, and I also did it. Was a, there was a player that played for Barnet. I was doing a reserve team game at Barnet. And he was the brother of Steve Ball. He used to play for Wolves. His name was Gary ball and the same thing happened to him during the game so unfortunately it doesn't happen very often I mean I've been doing it for 35 years now so um, it doesn't happen very often um, but yeah when it does happen your training kicks in and you you know what the right thing is to do. Good question coming in here from Lee Taylor who asks takes you back to 1993 and that cup final when you won the league cup and, of course, during the celebrations, Steve Morrow fell off somebody's shoulders, didn't he? And what did he do? Did he dislocate or break his shoulder? Uh, both. He, um, oh. Yeah, we won, the, we won the game 2-1. And obviously, we were celebrating after the game. And Steve went to jump on Tony Adams' shoulders. And not knowing, Tony was face on to Steve. He came running up to him, went to jump on him. Unbeknown, Tony ducked. So Steve has hit and flipped right over the top and landed on, on his arm. And, uh, yeah, he fractured his humerus and dislocated his shoulder. So, so unfortunately, you- I missed all the celebrations because one thing I used to do is I used to go and watch all the surgery. And uh, so we took Steve and the, the, the Clementine Churchill Hospital, which is a local one to Wembley. And uh, he had surgery that night. So I went in to watch the surgery made sure he recovered okay, spoke to him, and then joined the party. I got there about four o'clock in the morning. And then what about the very unfortunate injury that befell you? We remember you being out with England at the World Cup and on the touchline, something dreadful happened to you. Talk us through exactly what that was. Not the best day of my career. We were... We had a World Cup in Brazil, which, as you can imagine, is probably the greatest feeling in the world to go to Brazil for a World Cup final. And uh, 
Our first game is against Italy in Manaus, which is the rainforest. So it was a four hour flight from Rio. And uh, we equalised, Daniel Sturridge equalised, and uh, so we've all jumped up to celebrate. And I have jumped up, celebrated, and then gone to push off on my left foot to get the drink bottles. And my left foot slipped on the Astrid turf and went into a, um, it, it was like a gap between the Astrid turf and the pitch. And so my foot went into the gap. My foot went one way and my body, which was very big, went the other way. And uh, when I looked down at my ankle, my ankle was at 90 degrees. So I had a, several fractures and a dislocated ankle. And uh, unfortunately, that meant the end of my World Cup. I uh, had it reduced or realigned and uh, flew back with the team to Rio that night and flew back to London on the Sunday at one o'clock on the Monday and went straight into theatre. I mean, one, funny story, one funny story from that was one of the doctors flew back with me. So I'm sedated on the plane and uh, I was kneeled by mouth from seven o'clock in the morning because I was going straight into surgery. And uh, so I woke up about eight o'clock in the morning and uh, the doc's sitting there with a full English breakfast fry up on the plane. Lent over to me, went, you don't mind if I have some breakfast, do you? And all I could smell was this sausage, egg and bacon just coming over to me. And uh, I went, no, nah, you're right, doc. I rolled over and salt went the other way. So, yeah, it was an eventful trip. Yeah. And, and of course, for you, you'd have been part of all of the organisation in terms of going for site meetings before going out to Brazil to make yeah. sure all the medical backup was there. And in the end, it was there largely to get you back. Yeah. One of the, one of the things we, we played there the year before um, against Brazil, we drew 2-2. Two two, two two. Um, I think Alex Chamberlain equalised um, and um, so we went out there twice after that, after we qualified, and they, obviously they're called Reckies, and one is an unofficial one we did through the FA, and one was the FIFA one, where they do the FIFA workshops. And when you go to these places, you have a medical liaison officer, and at the training grounds and all the stadiums, there'll be a plan for each area. So what you do when you go on the Recce, you go through the EAP, and you meet all the consultants that you're going to deal with. Um, staff you know them um, um you know them well um in Manaus with the consultants and it was me on the table when they come in and I'm not sure who was more surprised me or the consultant when I saw the guy coming in oh dear um that must have been some experience. Let me ask you um a little bit about the dynamics of the relationship between physio and manager because i'm sure there must have been occasions where a manager is coming to you saying is so and so going to be fit for saturday can you get him fit um how much pressure do you feel in those circumstances to be 100 percent honest and to say look he's not going to be fit when the manager is putting real pressure on you to get them ready yeah what you, what you what you have to remember, as I mentioned it earlier, you have a duty of care and you can never, ever forget that. Now, when decisions are made about whether players play or not, it's not a uh, yes, no decision made by the medical team. It's a consensus where um, the player has. I mean, the biggest question you can ask a player is, do you think you can play? Because it doesn't matter what you think. If they don't think they can play, you're fighting a losing battle. They think they can play. Medically, you're not sure whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. So you have to explain all the different things that could happen. If they play and they broke down, how bad would it be? Um, if they don't play, how quickly would they get back? So you might miss one game to save three or four afterwards. Um, despite the pressure that the manager may try to put on you, you have to be open and honest with him. Um, and there are times when players will play and it is a risk. Um, the art is to get more right than you get wrong. Um, but sometimes it doesn't go well. I mean, I'm, there was one famous incident at Arsenal. I wasn't there at the time. My cousin was dealing with it. Cesc Fabregas played against Aston Villa and he was on the bench and he came on. He, we were drawing nil-nil. We desperately needed the points to, to get into Europe. And uh, he, he took a penalty and um, got a penalty and scored a goal, I think, and then re-injured his hamstring and came off. And after the game, Arsene went on, on to do his interviews and he said, 
No, the, the medical team informed me what the risk was. We discussed it with a player and it was a risk worth taking. Those three points we won today could be the difference between us getting in the Champions League and not. And that really puts it all into context. It, 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 it's a consensus. You have to speak to each other. But if you mustn't hide anything. As a medical person, if you're economic with the truth, it will come back and bite you. But you must have had a few really awkward moments, though, when you had to stand your ground. Oh, definitely. I mean, there's times when, uh, look, if, if, if it's a medical reason why they can't play, the end the story. And I've, I've been very, very lucky. I've never had a manager that's gone against the opinion. Um, but what you've got to remember is the majority of these aren't that easy. They're, 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 they're complicated. Um, and even if you do the perfect rehabilitation and have all the perfect markers, there's still no guarantee they're not going to break down. One, one of the biggest issues you have is when I first started in football, we would treat an injured player to get them fit to train. The manager would then train them and get them fit to play. In the present game, once they walk on that pitch to train, in the manager's eyes, they're fit to play. So the dynamics have changed quite a lot as well. And that's something you have to remember. So if you're returning the player to play, notoriously the day before a game, that training session is probably the lightest session of the week. So if your player is determining and their first training session is that day, are they really fit to play in the game the following day when that's the easiest training session of the week? So these are the things that you have to think about. So do they need to train a full week before they're, they're considered for selection? Um, and it also then, can they go on the bench? I mean, we have nine substitutes in the present game, in the present day game. Um, can you put a player on the bench knowing that they might, you might get 10 or 15 minutes out of them? So these are all the things that come into the decision-making. It's not as simple as it looks. Gary, over the years, you've been a great supporter of, of Maccabi GB. How did you get involved and, and why? Um, many years ago, when I first went to the FA, one concern I had is the role was more of a management role. So I was managing the 23 England teams, the physios to every team. And the only time I was working clinically was when I went on camp. So I spoke with the England doctor at the time and said, like, I want to get more clinical. I've got to keep my clinical skills up to date. So he arranged me at the time he worked at the Royal Ballet. So I used to go into the Royal Ballet and work with their medical teams. And he used to work at a, a medical centre called Centennial Medical Centre in Elstree. And um, he said to me, why don't you come and work at uh, Centennial with me? You can do a couple of clinics a week. And so I went along there and, and met um, Amanda Nathan um, at, at Centennial and um, they invited me to do a couple of clinics. And so I started doing, I think it was about 2012 that I started doing the clinics. And for me, it was fantastic because I was in clinical skills in my own time. And um, it was adding to um, what I needed to be to, to keep my clinical skills up to date. Um, and then through Centennial, I met um, somebody called Andy Landsberg. Um, I'm sure most of you know. And I think it's the open men's, they called it. But he, he worked with one of the teams. And... Uh, we started talking about the games and I've got to put my hands up. I've never heard of it. And then he gave me the book about the, uh, the, the games and uh, he said, how do you fancy working it? And um, that happened in 2016 when he first mentioned it to me and I just left England. And so I was going more into private practice and, uh, and I said, yeah, sounds great. I'd love to do it. It sounds like a great experience. And so I was due to go to the games in 2017 in Israel. But then at the last minute, Slavin Bilic phoned me up and asked what I fancy going to West Ham for a, and they put me on a one-year contract. So at the last minute I pulled out, I managed to find another physio from Pete, who they love, who carries on working with them now. And uh, so I missed out on the games, but I did all the prep with them and got them everything ready to go. And I was on the phone to them every day. And I remember watching the final that they lost um, um, on a screen out in Austria when we were out in pre-season West Ham. And then... Yeah, carried on the contact with Andy, and then we—I actually went to the the games in Budapest two um, two years ago, and uh, had a fantastic time. Loved every minute of it. Was made very very welcome. I was going to say, what was that experience really like when you are part of such a, a large group? It has a great social element. Um, it is a great opportunity for people to 
enjoy just how profound an experience team sport is. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been so lucky. You mentioned before that I've done five senior World Cups, two under 20 World Cups, five, four European Championships. I did the Olympics in 2012. I've done some under 17 tournaments. Uh, I've been to some massive tournaments with Arsenal. Um, and to experience this, what, what I would say is this, it's the closest thing I could have experienced outside of professional football that was like a professional tournament. The second thing that hit me is, um, obviously I'm not Jewish, but the cultural side of it, going to Budapest and getting involved in the culture and the history and it really opened my eyes to, to things and, and the culture. Um, I, I mean, lucky or unlucky, I've been to Auschwitz twice through my England travels. And that's something that is, is set in my head. That's something I'm never going to forget experience. It was one of the most emotional experiences I've ever had. And doing the games, it, it just opened my eyes up even more of the history and the culture. So... Yeah, for me, it was a great, I'm, I'm, I've already told Andy if I'm around and he wants me that I'm, I'm desperate to do the next in Israel. So um, hopefully I can experience the big one. All right, uh, great to hear. Um, some questions for, from some of the, the people listening to you tonight, Gary. Um, let's ask you this one. What's your view? This comes from John Wilford on the current concussion debate. Um, he is a Wolves supporter, so obviously that relates to the Raul Jimenez incident at Arsenal earlier on this season. Would you be very concerned about him playing again? I mean, he's started back some very light training by himself, but how concerned are you about that? I think when a significant injury like that, you have to go back to basics. You must treat the person first. And the most important thing was there was no significant damage that's going to affect him as a person. So he's going to have a normal life. There was no neurological deficit. There was no sensory deficit. Um, next, can he then return to sport? And it looks like he's going through the process of returning to sport. Once he's done that, then can he return to professional sport? So... I think you have to go through the phases. Yes, there's still concerns there, but the early signs are very, very positive. Um, one thing it did highlight is the exceptional um, care that players get now. Um, the way the, the Wolves medical team and the paramedics at the Emirates dealt with that incident, very similar to Ryan Mason at, when he was playing at Chelsea and he fractured his skull. The medical care now that they get to none. And... Um, so I think that needs to be uh, uh, applauded uh, where the game's gone with that. Um, and yes, there's always concerns, but I must admit, it, I'm very positive that he is going to return. Just going back to that incident, obviously he clashed with David Louise, who, who went down, was treated, had a bandage put on his head, and then eventually went off as the blood was seeping out. And then, you know, there were worries that concussion protocols had not been perhaps followed as stringently as they should have been by the side of the pitch. Now, Arsenal yeah. deny that. But do you yeah. think football takes this seriously enough? And have you also welcomed concussion substitutes? Um, yes, football are taking it seriously. I'm actually on a committee in women's football on concussion, um, and they are taking it very seriously. Um, I do, I am happy about the rule changes that as allowing concussion subs. Um, I would have preferred 15 minute temporary substitutions rather than permanent substitutions. I am concerned about the fact that if one team has a concussion sub, the other team then gets a free hit for a sub um, because I'm concerned that's going to be used tactically in a game of football. Um, but that's what this pilot's for. It's to see what happens. So I'm not against what's going on at the moment. I'm completely for it. And, and as long as it helps the welfare of players and being very biased, it supports the medical staff in the jobs they have to do. I'm all for it. That, by the way, that question, thanks to Andrew Myers for that one. Um, 
Here's a great question from David Wolf, who says, how can you identify when a player is faking an injury for one reason or another? Um, the problem is you can't always. Um, I've got one very, very funny incident that I had. I won't name the player. Um, but he was notoriously bad for overreacting to injuries. And I've gone on to him and he's rolling around holding his foot. And the doctor was standing next to the manager, um, Arson, pitch side, and I'm on the radio treating the player. And Arson begins to get agitated and he said to the doc, what's going on? What's going on? Find out what's going on. The doc says to me very politely, Gaz, the, uh, the boss is asking what's going on. My to him was, Doc, he could have broken his effing toe or he could have broken his effing toe now. I haven't got a clue. And the Doc very nonchalantly went round to the manager and says, he's assessing him, boss. It won't be a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and that probably sums up the problems you have. Um, it is very, very difficult. Um, one thing I would say is... Um, Normally, if they're feigning injury, they don't want you to go on because under the current rules, it means they have to leave the field of play. Um, and the second thing is you now can buy yourself time. And I did it many times, even though I've not been running on for a few years. Um, you call the stretcher on and it buys you a bit of time to assess them a bit more fully. So, but difficult one. That, that, that's the difficult side of the game. Um, Joe Lachter asks, do you miss the day-to-day -day match day experience? Like mad, I'll do it, start, I'll do it again tomorrow. Um, as I said, I am working with the Arsenal women's team and I do go there on a match day that I don't run on anymore. And yes, I miss it like mad. And it, 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 as I said, I'd go back to it tomorrow if I could. Can I say, Gary, that I was working with Lee Dixon at uh, West Ham yeah. last week. And he mentioned yeah. you on the radio um, as saying that there is a particular running style that every physio has when they run out with their bag of tricks. And he said that most of the Arsenal team used to do impressions of you running on with your yeah. little bag of tricks. Is that right? And were they good at it? Yeah. They were great at it, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that I was a good one, but I used to get my own back because when I used to run them when they were injured, <laughs> then I'd really get my own back. Um, yeah, I mean, they used to take them because when you're carrying a bag, you can't move your arm. So what you end up doing is you have one straight arm, one one arm that's going like the clappers to try and catch up the other arm. And they, they, they used to rib me a lot over that, yeah. Um, a question here from Chris Anderson. Um, you were involved in... Eduardo's rehabilitation. So, a Brazilian striker who suffered a terrible, what was it, ankle injury at, at Birmingham? Yeah, he had an open fracture, uh, tib and fib fracture at Birmingham in the first three minutes of the game. Yeah. Yeah, that um, was a nasty, that was a career threatening injury. And uh, thankfully, you could argue he didn't come back the same player, but he did come back. He, he played again and he went on to Shakhtar Donetsk and he actually came back to the Emirates and played for them and scored against Arsenal. So, um, yeah, I mean, that he was out for about, about nine months he was out. And that must be particularly distressing when you immediately see that something like that is so serious and potentially career-threatening, because trying to calm the player, the player must be panicked to such a, an extent. Yeah, I mean, you, your training kicks in, so what you're doing is looking after the injury, um, we, we classify significant injuries as life life saving um, or life threatening injuries or limb threatening injuries, and that was a limb threatening injury. Um, and then again, that's where your experience comes in. So what I did that day is like Gilberto Silva was playing, and when the players get injured, they always revert to their native tongue. And Eduardo, being Brazilian, um, although he played for Croatia, he was Brazilian and the um, background. Um, I got Gilberto to kneel next to him. So he couldn't see his leg and talking to him in, um, in Portuguese. Um, and then, so any questions I asked, I would ask Gilberto who asked the player, he would calm the player down. We got some gas into him, calmed him down. We re realigned and immobilized the leg and then we got him off. I think we got him off into the ambulance in about eight minutes. So that's, that's the key to it is getting them to get um, professional care as soon as you can. 
Um, this question from Darren Nathan. Um, he says that we hear lots about fallouts in training, arguments that take place on the, the training pitch. But I bet that there are a lot of laughs too. Is there a memorable, funny moment that you could share to a family audience? <laughs> um, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a difficult question to try and think. Well, of who, who were the big jokers in, say, the Invincibles at Arsenal? Who, who, were, the, who were the big jokers? Um... Yeah, I mean, that was quite a serious bunch you've mentioned there, to be fair. Um, I mean, Lee Dixon was probably one of the funniest. Um, um, and, and, yeah, Nigel was funny. Um, I'm trying to think of it. And it's probably one of the funniest things I can remember was actually on England duty. And uh, it got in all the papers. And uh, we were playing Moldova away, I think it was, with England. And um, the players went to watch the under-21s the night before the first team played. And uh, to get into where the seats were, we had to climb over a wall. And as they've climbed over a wall, Paul Gascoigne has pulled down Paul Winsley's shorts. And there's this massive moon going on. And of course, one of the papers got it, and it was a front page of the papers. I mean, he got absolutely battered for it. I'm trying to think some of the funny things. I mean, the, the larking around goes on all the time, um, cutting people's laces in their boots or putting deep peat in their underpants or <laughs> all the usual stuff that you get in a football club um and hiding people's outrageous gear or hanging it up from the ceiling in the dressing room if they've got a loud shirt on or a loud pair of trousers um you just mentioned though paul gascoigne there mm. i mean he, he must have been talk about high maintenance in in looking after him it wasn't, no, I wouldn't call him high maintenance because he was just an absolute fruitcake, but one of the nicest people you're ever going to meet in your life. Um, he, he was just the most, the most kind hearted person you could ever meet. Again, we played in Georgia and um, there was a disabled lad sitting in a wheelchair as they come off. And Gaza, as he always does, went flying up to him, covered in mud, soaking wet, gave him the biggest cuddle you could imagine, and got this kid drenched and then stood there and took all his kit off including his boots, down to his underpants and gave it to the boy and then went in. Following morning, we get up for, uh, for breakfast and he goes to the kit man, I'll do us a favour, go and buy me a pair of boots, size eight. And the kit man went, why? He went, well, I gave my boots to that lad last night. I've got no boots to play in tonight. <laughs> and that's what he was like. He was not even that case, but one of the most kind, hardest people you're ever going to meet. OK, last couple of questions, because we're running quite short of time. Uh, I mean, there are so many that have, have come in. Um, somebody asking about the, the Ars Arsenal did have a, a, a spate of injuries to a, a lot of their, you know, younger players, you know, the Walcotts, the Ramses, um, you know, any particular reasons why that might have been? Yeah, I left and I blamed my cousin who took over for me. Uh -huh. uh, the medical teams always get the blame for this. Well, one argument I always have, it's not the medical team that get them injured. We're the ones that pick up the pieces after they've got injured. Um, look, there's, there are lots of many reasons. There are lots of reasons why these things happen. Um, so Theo, I was there when we signed Theo, and we knew that he had lax shoulder joints and he was prone to dislocation. Um, and that would have been part of the medical profiling that we did on him when we signed him. So that wasn't completely unexpected. Um, a lot of the other injuries you get can be based upon recruitment. Are they physically strong enough? Have you signed players with previous injuries? Aaron Ramsey's uh, a, a classic. I mean, who could actually foresee that kind of tackle happening to break his leg? That's got nothing to do with um, being injury prone. That was a bad tackle. Um, Eduardo being exactly the same. I know Jack Wilch has had a, a very bad time with injuries, but if you look back, he had a ball and then he had that really nasty tackle with Man United at the Emirates and he had to have more surgery on his ankle. So he had two operations on his ankle in about a year. The, the biggest cause of injury is previous medical history mm. so if you've had lots of injuries the risk of you getting more injuries goes up so 
yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors. Um, okay, last couple of questions. Um, here's a, a, a quite a, um, a specialist question here from Josh Pedro. To what extent does your role as a physio blur across to acting partly as a doctor? And how do you pick up these more medical related skills? Well, I'm a chartered physio, so my training is, was done on the ward. So I would do orthopedics, outpatients. My first job when I qualified was in uh, the cardiac intensive care unit at Guy's Hospital. So you have general medical trainings when you become a chartered physio. Plus, when you're working full time with doctors, you do pick up a lot of medicine and general medicine and you're talking to the doctor all the time about things to look out for, medication, um, treatment of different kinds of injuries. What you must never forget, these are people first, football a second. So people forget that they can have general illnesses. They can suffer from depression. They can have problems with their bowel. They can have problems with their kidneys and their liver. Um, they're people first and sports people second. So you do experience a lot of general medicine, part of your training and by experience more than anything else. And just finally, Gary, a little bit about, you know, your current business at the moment. You have your own clinic, which you are in partnership with your cousin, Colin, as you mentioned. So how yeah. is that going? And again, I, I suppose a lot of your previous players and contacts have kept in touch with you and wanted to be involved in all of this. Is that right? Yeah, we've been very lucky. We decided in 2018 that we were going to set up together and form our own clinic. It took a year in the planning. Um, we were very lucky we got some really good investors. Aaron Ramsey invested, Petter Check invested, and don't laugh at this, but Meza Ozil in invested in the clinic as well before he went to Turkey. Um, so we, we got three great investors from our point of view. We have set up a clinic in the vision that we had of how elite sport needs to be dealt with. So we've got uh, our own clinical rooms, we've got um, our own gymnasium or, or rehab gym. And the whole vision of the clinic was to see Joe Public coming in with any form of injury, seeing them from the acute stage into the subacute stage, referring them on to the top specialists that we obviously have got contact with, getting scans easily done, getting referrals easily done. And then going through the final stage rehab in the gym and onto the pitches. And we've got an agreement with the local football club and we use their pitches. So it's the it's an, a one stop shop for everything to go all the way through from the early stage to the final stage rehab. And yeah, it's going very well. We're 15 months old. We lost three months due to COVID, um, which was difficult. But we're now working with all the uh, PPE protocols in place. And uh, I still work one day a week at Centennial Medical Centre in Elstree. And uh, I still see a few of the players there. And uh, But my main role is at the Lewin Sports Injury Clinic in Hainault, Essex. Well, that's brilliant. Gary, thanks so much for your time. I've, 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 there are lots of other things that I'd love to have asked you about, but we, we've run out of time this evening. Wish I've enjoyed you, it. Thank you. Wish yeah. you luck with the clinic. And those are some seriously brilliant signs behind you. Very envious yeah. of all of those. Um, well, thanks to all of you for attending. I think it's time just to have some closing words now. So for that, I'm going to hand over to Maccabi GB trustee and general team manager, Joel Nathan. Thanks very much, Rob, um, and Gary, for your time this evening. Uh, it's been a great evening, and we are looking forward uh, to continuing these evening in sessions uh, over the next few months. Um, as Rob said, thank you, everyone, who uh, joined this evening. And if anyone did make a donation, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of uh, things I would like to add. As some of you are aware, MGB have launched the Yellow Candle Project to remember the victims of the Holocaust. Yom HaShoah will take place on April the 7th. And to be part of the community-wide commemoration, you can purchase your candles via the Yellow Candle website as per the screen. NGB also, with in conjunction with Wizzo UK and Jammy, on the 7th of March, um, running a Keeping Your Head in the Game um, evening, which Rob will be back chairing the panel as the experts discuss the impacts of emotions, 
of, on performance and the mental health issues expressed by athletes. The panel is Gary Bloom, sports performance psychotherapist, elite athletes, broadcaster, author, host of award-winning therapy show on the sporting couch. Pat Nevin, the ex-Scottish retired footballer, played for Clyde, Chelsea, Everton, Tramway Rovers, Kilmarnock and Motherwell. And Louise Komodi, head of services for Jamming. Uh, we will send further details out in the post-event email. There is also um, a new initiative run by Jackie Turner, a very good friend of Rob Nothman's called Strictly Chair Yoga. Jackie runs these chair yoga and dance lessons for people to boost their health and well-being. She makes it fun and she has adapted Latin and ballroom contemporary dancing to the chair with suitable music. MGB will be running a couple of these trial sessions on Monday the 8th of March and Thursday the 18th of March. Also, just following um, the Boris Johnson's announcements today regarding the uh, easing of the lockdowns, um, the Maccabee Games, um, due to take place next July in 2022, um, MGB will be relaunching um, our squad selection process probably in the next couple of weeks and um, please keep an eye out for that and if anyone has any interest in applying for the game please go to the Maccabi GB website but again thank you very much for attending this evening's session Rob Gary hopefully Gary will see you at the next Maccabi games um, you bring a bit of a hell of a professionalism to the uh, the squad and I'm sure everyone who goes on this on the tour with us really appreciates you being there so thank you very much everyone keep safe and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, out of lockdown very soon. Thank you very much.